Good afternoon, this is Charlie Albright. I'm the CSO of Anitas, and it's my great pleasure today to have Andrew Schiermeyer from uh, Antelia and Jason Fondo from Sangamo to join me today to discuss uh, where we are with cell-based medicines and CAR-Ts and engineered T-cell receptors and a lot of interesting topics like that. So why don't we start with introductions. Uh, Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself more fully? Uh, sure. Thanks, Charlie. Well, my name is Andrew Schiermeyer, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Intellia Therapeutics. Uh, I've been at Intellia now for about four years, and previous to that, I was Head of Global Oncology at Merck Germany uh, for the, the Global Oncology franchise. Great to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Jason? Uh, Jason Fondo. I am uh, Head of Cell Therapy at, at Sangamo Therapeutics and also uh, Interim Head of Research. Um, I've been at Sangamo for about uh, about 18 months now. Um, prior to Sangamo, um, I worked at a small Seattle company uh, called Immusoft for a little bit. And then before that was at uh, Juno Therapeutics where I was head of exploratory research. And actually uh, worked worked with uh, with Charlie in our collaboration with Editas. Well, it's great, certainly great to see you again. And. Uh... And so let, let's start the discussion by talking about some of the uh, interesting molecules you guys have in development. So uh, Andrew, the Intellia has a, has a uh, NL, NTLA 5001, which I'll abbreviate as 5001, so I don't stumble over the uh, abbreviation every time. But tell us a little bit about that molecule, where, how you found it, where it's headed. Sure. Well, thanks for the question. And uh, yeah, 5001, it's not our 5001st development candidate, but uh, we have a, trust me, we do have a convention in terms of our, our numerical nomenclature. Um, you know, Intellia, we like to consider ourselves a full spectrum gene editing company. So we are doing, we have programs in both in vivo and programs in the ex vivo cell therapy space. 5001 is our lead candidate right now in the cell therapy space. And it's a TCR-directed T cell. Uh, we are using a transduced uh, TCR for the WT1 receptor. That's Wilms Tumor One. And uh, you know, the, we we think that um, it's going to be a really interesting molecule. The first indication that we're aiming it towards, or that we intend to aim it towards, is AML, acute myeloid leukemia. And, you know, maybe just a couple of comments on where it came from, as you asked. Uh, it, you know, this, this molecule actually comes from a wonderful collaboration that we have with Ospedale San Raffaele in Milan. Uh, and Chiara Bonini is the primary investigator there. And uh, the folks at OSR are the ones who actually did the original hunting for the TCR. Uh, and we find that it has some really, you know, fantastic capabilities and uh, the, the, the kind of attributes that we're really looking for in TCRs. Um, you know, when it comes to cell therapy, we can obviously be uh, directing towards, I think that, you know, the, the field pretty much has agreed that we can be directing towards CARs or TCRs. So the, the typical question is, well, why a TCR and not, not starting out in CARs? And I think that, you know, there's, there's multiple reasons for that. We started this program several years back when we were really ramping up our cell therapy program. And, you know, I think there's a general consensus in the field at this point that if we want to ultimately go for solid tumors, TCRs might be the better bet. Um, and of course, TCR is writ large. That's a, that's a broad subject. And you can have, you know, antigens that are overexpressed in cancer. You can have novel but shared uh, kinds of TCRs like KRAS. Then you can even go all the way up to neoepitopes where these are unique mutations that happen in a patient's cancer. But all of them keep that TCR theme uh, as, as the same sort of receptor that you, you want to be using to target. So that, that somewhat explains our, our initiation into TCRs. We'd like to ultimately be able to go into solid tumors later. Certainly WT1 is, uh, is, is the kind of receptor that's overexpressed in many, many different types of cancers. And I think it gives us some opportunity to uh, go further than AML. Well, that's really interesting. And so you mentioned a couple of things in there that I wanted to follow up on. And so um, it, it would seem like the attributes you're looking for in a TCR are somewhat different than they are in a car. And can, can you kind of elaborate on some of the unique features with the, with the TCR, some of the things you're worried about in, in picking, picking a good TCR? 
Yeah, well, I, you know, one of the primary differences between a TCR and a CAR is obviously the HLA restriction that you find. So, uh, you know, I won't go into the depths of the immunology right here, but I think for those who are somewhat familiar with the field, we understand that, uh, you know, the, the HLAs are polyallelic and there's differences amongst them in the population. So the first thing about a TCR is that it is very, very highly tailored to um, to each individual patient and patient groups. And there's many, many of these alleles out there. So I think when we looked at the difference between TCRs and CARs, um, you know, CARs do one thing extraordinarily well with a high avidity and a high affinity. You can get them to bind extremely strongly onto their target and cause immediate killing. And that's been the tremendous success of CD19. And, you know, potentially BCMA, I think we're starting to see some interesting uh, data come out with that. But once you go beyond those, you know, at least in our view, it becomes somewhat difficult to start finding those targets that are as unique and that, as, that are as selectable, if you will, um, beyond CD19 and BCMA. And you start getting into the on-target, off-tumor kinds of issues. So for us, the, the, the point of the TCRs is, you know, and they, they are uh, exquisitely more selective than a typical car. And there are certain attributes about avidity and affinity that you want to keep in mind. And, and so that's all part of tuning the TCR properly. But if you've done it right, I think you have a really good recipe for a successful potential product that is just exquisitely selective for the target that you want to take out. And that's a great point. And since the, um, the, some of your, certainly some of your TCR targets are likely to be expressed on normal tissue at some level. And how do you, how do you think about trying to buy down the safety risk before you enter clinical trials? I mean, I, I'm not asking for your detailed tox plan or anything, but just conceptually, how do you think about that? Yeah, well, I, I think that it, it really comes down to the physics of how the TCRs are expressed on the surface and what your assumptions are about that expression level. So as you know, any given cancer cell is going to be expressing a certain amount of these MHC receptors and a certain amount of, let's say, Wilms tumor 1 or WT1. And so I think there, there, there is a step here, and to your question, I think it's a very important one, all TCRs are not alike. They do behave differently, and they do behave differently in the presence of a different, let's say, population density of receptors on a cell surface. So I think that you need to actually be tuning and looking at, you know, you're, you're trying to find a sweet spot. It's somewhat of a Goldilocks problem. You don't want that TCR to be so ultra, um, uh, you know, have such affinity that if it finds a cell with a single receptor on it, it's going to bind and kill. You want to be able to fit in a zone where you, you've tuned the affinity and avidity of that TCR in such a way that you're only going to hit, hopefully, the cells that are expressing at some threshold and above. That's really interesting. And so as I was reading through some of your work, you did some really interesting preclinical work to actually construct this cell, okay? And so you you knocked out both the track A and the track B genes. Can you can you comment a bit sure. on why you did that and 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 exactly how you did it to to minimize translocations? Oh sure, yeah. So uh, two two separate questions. I'll start with the track A and B, and that's a that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, you know, in the field, I think we see quite frequently the, the notion of knocking out track. And that, that we, you know, we see now quite frequently even in the car field because you don't want those cells to be cross-reacting and have graft versus host kinds of effects. So that makes a lot of sense. And you don't want to confuse the T cell between two receptors. So usually track is plenty to do that. You render that, that cell's uh, endogenous TCR um, uh, unfunctional, if you will. But it's, if you're putting in a new TCR, it's really not enough to only knock out track because, uh, again, going into a little bit more detail, the TCR itself is made of two chains, an alpha and a beta chain. And if you're knocking out track, which is the alpha chain, and you leave in the beta, and then you go and you transduce in a new uh, external, you know, your new TCR, your WT1, you have the potential what's called mispairing. You still have that cell creating that beta chain that you don't want, but it's swimming around there and it will mispair. And what's really interesting is what we found is that uh, even while in early days, I think there was a notion of trying to downplay, you know, 
how likely is it really that this thing is going to mispair, we do find that for certain sequences and for certain TCRs, the mispairing can be dramatic, very high. Uh, and that gives you a whole other safety issue. So we wanted to remove that from the equation entirely. Um, as a CRISPR company, we can create a, a, a nice TRBC knockout and we get rid of that entirely. So that, that, that's our plan and we just eliminate that threat um, wholesale. The other thing that you asked is about, I think you were referring to uh, minimizing translocations. And that's, again, another one of these subjects that gets a lot of attention. And that's important. Um, you know, we, we don't want to be going into the cell with so many guides and chopping up with our molecular scissors so many places that these, the, you know, <laughs> uh, the chromosomes re, re, reconstitute themselves in some Frankensteinian way, Frankensteinian way. Uh, so it's important. You don't want to have some, you know, I think of it as putting spaghetti in a blender, if you will. And then if you put those things back together, you don't know what. So we took a real strong look at how could we do this and limit the number of edits that are going on at any given time simultaneously. And what we found is we are able now, and this is an important part of, I think, any uh, cell therapy process, uh, to do sequential editing. We do one edit first, we wait a certain amount of time, we do the next edit, then we do the next. And traditionally what has limited that quite a lot is the, the fact that T cells don't like, <laughs> they don't like to be stimulated, they don't like to be shocked with electric uh, voltage and, and electroporated. So we had to come up with a proprietary process that does that, but also leaves the T cell very happy at the end of the day to go fight its fight against cancer. And um, I can't go into too much detail about that because it's still our lawyers are, are real keen on making sure that we, uh, you know, we keep our IP intact. But um, we're, we're very happy about that process. And we think that that's now opened up a lot of horizons for multiple edits in the same cell. Yeah, that was very impressive, the work that you showed at the, I think it was last year's ASGCT. And, Thanks. Uh, um, and, then, and then one final question, because I haven't forgotten about you, Jason. The, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, know you, I know you're there. Um, I'm sure people want to hear from Jason. So. Yes, they, they will. Jason, Jason will get his, his moment in the sun. The, uh, um, probably mixed the metaphor there, sorry. But the, um, uh, so these, these uh, ETCRs are HLA restricted, as you point out. How do you think about the patients, the, the rest of the population? Because I think the HLA you're going at will serve maybe 40% of the population. I forget the numbers. But the, how do you think about the rest of the patients? Assuming that the drug worked, how do you think about expanding to the rest of the to the rest sure. of the patients? Yeah, well, look, I mean, if if it works, that's going to be a wonderful problem to have. I mean, I would start with that because right now, you know, we're still at the point where we're just in very early days in cell therapy. I think it's tremendously exciting. I think the potential, obviously, is enormous. But we're learning a lot. And so, you know, we have to learn to walk before we can run. So obviously, we take the HLAs that we think are going to uh, be applicable to the, the largest proportion of the population as, as the beginning step. And uh, certainly, if we're able to show efficacy, and we know that we're on the right track, and there's so many variables to work out, but you know, you have your development candidate, it's focused on 0201. Generally, it's the, you know, the most prevalent in uh, in U.S. populations currently, um, then we can begin to look at uh, treating other HLA types. So same epitope, WT1, but other types. And, you know, you can actually, we have looked at this, and you can go from 40% of the population to upwards of 90% of the population with relatively small sizes of banks. Of, uh, of banks. And I do think that, um, you know, if we get to the point, and you know, perhaps this is another topic that we'll want to talk about more after Jason gets a, a chance to chat. Uh, you know, allogeneic cells are going to be a really important part of our future here, and I think that allogeneic you can't talk about you know treating sort of the broad population with TCRs without a, a good conversation about allogeneic. But I, I definitely think it's doable. It just needs to be a you know a second step. Yeah, that's that's great. And so that it, it sounds like a very exciting product. When do you? Um, when do you anticipate being in the in the clinic? Uh, so we've guided to uh, to uh, an IND next year uh, for our WT1. So that's uh, you know we're we're working very hard right now at putting the finishing touches and doing everything that we need to, and then uh, we'll be uh, we'll be in the clinic. I well. 
the, the guidance that we've put out is is for an IND next year. Right, right. That's great. I, uh, well, thanks. That was that was uh, immensely interesting. So let's let's turn to Jason. Uh, Jason uh, Sangamo did a substantial deal with Kite some time ago. Can you what can you tell us about that uh, about that relationship and and what what's what we can expect there? Yeah. So. Um, um, Kite, uh, the Kite partnership has been uh, going uh, really well. Um, we uh, we have plans for multiple products, but the first uh, the first product, and and the partnership's really built around uh, leveraging Sangamo's uh, uh, zinc finger technology for for editing uh, uh, T cells and NK cells in uh, in oncology. And really around this idea of, of creating uh, um, allogeneic um, off-the-shelf therapies, right? And so the, the first product that is coming out of the collaboration with Kite is a CD19 targeted um, allogeneic therapy. And um, that's uh, moving forward very well. We, uh, Kite um, had announced that they were planning to get into the clinic this year. But due to the COVID situation, um, uh, I think that they've said that there is going to be a potential delay until next year. Um, but um, you know, from from the from the standpoint of the collaboration, everything is is going really well, and they've been they've been great partners. So it's uh, it's an exciting exciting time. And you know, uh, one really uh, you know nice thing about the collaboration is that there's a certain set of engineering steps right that are going to be the same for any product in terms of creating a, an off-the-shelf therapy but um, you know we're also looking toward the possibility of also you know kind of doing other types of engineering uh, with our with our uh, tools to you know kind of enable best-in-class products and, and have you disclosed which edits you're making to make it allogeneic or is that still uh, under wraps if you will you know, I, I, as, uh, as, as, as Annie was speaking, I, I was trying to recall if it's been disclosed or not, and I can't, okay. I, I'm not well, don't, absolutely don't, don't sure. Don't do it then. We don't need this to be the place where you disclose things. Yeah, yourself. I mean, I'm sure that uh, it's, uh, you know, at least, at least one of the edits is, is uh, relatively obvious, uh, given our dis discussion here. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, everyone understands what the immunology involved is, so, um, um, yeah, I don't. Right. Well, that'll be, that'll be exciting. I think we're we're all looking forward to the readouts from the allogeneic approaches. Maybe we'll come back to that in a few minutes. But you you uh, as Sangamo kind of uniquely gone into the autoimmune space with engineering T regulatory cells and and TX two hundred. Can you talk a little bit about that since it's so it it is so unique in the field right now? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, so the the program on um, on engineered regulatory T cells that Sangamo has is really kind of what brought me to the company. Um, I've uh, I've worked in the regulatory T cell field uh, for quite a while, um, even going back to my my days in graduate school. Um, so it it was it was an area that I was kind of extremely interested in seeing seeing through to the clinic and excited about uh, kind of leveraging the the learnings from the cell therapy field in oncology and applying those to regulatory T cells as a modality to kind of uh, address a lot of the unmet need in, in autoimmune disease. So, um, so that's why I came to Sangamo was because of the, of the engineered regulatory T cell program. And, and the program came to Sangamo through the acquisition of a small uh, French company called TXL. Um, so uh, in, I guess, uh, about about six months before I joined the company, Sangamo acquired TXL, and they have a program which is called TX200, which is now Sangamo program, that is uh, targeting a HLA mismatch in renal transplantation. So we have a CAR that is directed to HLA A2, and and we're introducing that CAR into uh, uh, purified regulatory T cells from patients who are A2 negative, but are receiving an A2 positive uh, kidney transplant. And so the idea then obviously is that the CAR will target the regulatory T cells to the, to the, uh, the transplanted kidney and will drive the accumulation and expansion of the Tregs in that organ 
uh, and create kind of a zone of immune regulation, if you will, uh, in, in the kidney and, and allow the patients to be weaned off of immunosuppressives and inhibit rejection of the kidney. So, so can you talk a little bit about the unmet need? Is that the, are you going after patients who are rapidly rejecting the kidney or you mentioned getting them off the, these, these really ugly drugs that uh, contribute to the, um, that help the patients prevent from rejecting the, the transplant, but exactly, exactly how are you thinking about the unmet need here? Yeah, no, we're, we're not going after uh, acute rejection here. So, uh, you know, the, the, the approach will be uh, to go into patients uh, after they've received their transplant. So we'll, we'll actually be, um, we'll be uh, apheresing the patient in advance of the transplant. We'll, uh, we'll be, you know, creating the, the cells and banking those cells. And then the, and then the patient will, will receive the transplant. And then sometime after that, we will then infuse the cells back into the patient. And uh, our plan is to, you know, uh, initially monitor for, you know, the, the expansion of those cells. And, and then the trial is designed to, to, if things are looking good, there's an opportunity to kind of begin to wean the, the patient off of immunosuppressives. That's a really interesting design. It'll be a fascinating, fascinating outcome. So most people are at least conceptually familiar with harvesting the alpha beta T cells for CAR Ts and ETCRs. Exactly, how do you get the T regs, and aren't they a lot less frequent? And how does that all play out as you think about making making this medicine? Yeah, so that's that's one of the uh, the big uh, challenges uh, in uh, the kind of T reg uh, approach, right? I mean, we're we're certainly uh, building on a lot of the work that's been done by the pioneering companies that have developed these first uh, cell therapy products in, uh, in cancer, the CAR T therapy products. But there are some very unique aspects uh, of Tregs that we've had to invest a lot of time and effort in, in solving uh, some of these challenges. And, and isolating the cells is certainly one of the most important ones. So there's there's basically no kind of perfectly unique marker on the cell surface of Tregs that one can kind of easily kind of using, you know, kind of bead-based technologies, which is what most people do to isolate T cells. Uh, there's, no, there's no easy way to get a very pure population of Tregs using a bead-based technology. And so at the moment we're using a combination of, of, of bead-based uh, sorting and, uh, you know, optical Facts-based sorting to get a highly pure population because we we view having a very pure population as critical to the success of the therapy. One of the kind of interesting biological aspects of, of Tregs is is that they're fairly um, they relative to effector T cells they don't proliferate nearly as much in response to antigen stimulation, and so um, if if one does have contaminating effector cells in your prep of Tregs during the process, the manufacturing process where we expand the cells, the effector cells can quickly outgrow the Tregs and, and then you've got a real problem. And so we've invested uh, quite a lot of time uh, and the team has done some great work to develop a process where we can get really uh, amazingly pure cells to, to begin the, the process of, uh, of you know, generating the, the cell dose. Well, that's really interesting. I think a significant technology advance there. And so <clears throat> the choice of solid organ transplant is really, uh, uh, really a great choice from, at least it seems like to me, because you, you know the antigen, you know an antigen you want to go af after with Tregs. It's, it, if, if, if they're going to work, this is probably one of the better, the better case studies for that, which is exactly what you'd like to see when you start in something new, right? But how do you think about antigens in, um, in autoimmune disease or, or other diseases where Tregs could potentially have a dramatic effect? How do you, where, where is the state of the field and kind of figure out how to target those Tregs? Yeah, yeah, so, you know, just to comment on, on, the, on the A2 program, it is, you know, it's, I think it's, it, it, it wasn't my idea, so I can say it was a great idea. Um, um, uh, Let's take your actual, it's okay. It, it came from uh, a collaboration with uh, a scientist at the University of British Columbia, Megan Levings, 
Uh, she published a paper describing an A2 car targeted T-Reg and, uh, and TXL partnered with her. And it, yeah, it is a really nice test case because it's kind of a perfectly clean antigen. It's expressed only in the kidney graft. You know it's not expressed in the patient. And the other really nice thing about uh, the approach is that, uh, you know, you know uh, the, the transplant is the initiation of the problem, right? So it's, it begins on the day, you know, you have perfect timing there. It's not some long smoldering disease that you have to deal with, right? So I think it does provide a really uh, excellent opportunity for us to, to see the, uh, the effects of the, of the T-regs. In terms of, of in terms of antigen targeting, um, you know, it's it's one of the things that I think is uh, kind of really differentiated from from the CAR T space in oncology, because un, unlike that space where you have, you know, it's it's been really challenging to find kind of clean targets, right? Because of this concern of kind of off tumor effects um, when you're dealing with uh, cytolytic cells that are, you know, that can kill any cell that they encounter that expresses the antigen. In, in Tregs, we're really just kind of using the antigen to kind of put the cells where we need them to be. So I think there's a slightly lower bar in terms of how selective that antigen needs to be. And so really what we're looking for are just nicely tissue restricted antigens. Uh, and we feel pretty good that for, you know, most of the kind of major autoimmune diseases that we're interested in, we can find, we can find at least a few different, uh, a few different kind of cell surface antigens that we can target. You know, I'll use as an example uh, in multiple sclerosis, right? You can, you can kind of, I think anyone, any, any immunologist will kind of be able to quickly rattle off at least a few of the kind of common targets that are used in the uh, models of MS. And it, it, and these are used because they're kind of tissue restricted antigens like MOG and MBP, right? And so, so there are antigens that are uh, pretty exquisitely kind of tissue restricted in most cases, and we can use these to target the Tregs. There's still going to be a little bit of ambiguity in things that uh, we're really focused on understanding and learning about. For instance, you know, uh, does it make a difference? you know, wh where the antigen is expressed anatomically um, and uh, at what level, right? Um, you know, there's gonna be some variation in those and how that affects uh, the activation and accumulation of the cells is something that we're you know, be trying to understand. Pretty, you know, similar questions to, I think, what, uh, what uh, is uh, happening in oncology. Right, right, absolutely a parallel. Probably some learnings will go undoubtedly both ways. And then, then one final kind of set of questions, if you will. I, I noticed in your uh, corporate slide deck that you have an IPSC effort. Can you can you comment on that and how that fits into this? And, and yeah, absolutely. So you know, I think like like the oncology field, uh, the cell therapy uh, you know field in oncology, we view kind of off the shelf uh, allogeneic products as really kind of the the future. Uh, simply because you know we can we can increase the access for patients anywhere and everywhere and and we can lower the cost of goods and um, so we have a major effort to both develop a you know the engineering steps in the t-regs to understand how how those uh, uh, those changes will affect the biology of the cells and can can we maintain them so a push for a healthy donor uh, allo approach, uh, but we're also very interested in in deriving Tregs from from IPSCs as a potential avenue to to developing an off the shelf product. So um, given given that we think it's you know kind of a, a very important aspect of any kind of future cell therapy franchise, we're uh, really kind of pushing uh, to take as many shots on goal at getting getting uh, to, that, to that place however we can. The other, the other approach that I'll just, we, we did a collaboration with a company in the UK called Mography uh, last year, and they have a technology, kind of a bioinformatics approach to kind of identify factors where you can kind of, rather than take 
what I think people call a morphogen approach with IPSCs, where you kind of just try to repeat the differentiation process that naturally occurs. They have an approach to kind of basically identify a key set of factors that can help you go from one cell type to another directly. And so we're also exploring that approach. Yeah, that, that, that was good. Along those lines is what I was uh, wondering, because it's kind of what is the state of the art in making key regs from IPSCs. And so you see some cell types right now seem easier to do. I kind of wondered on that spectrum, where do you, where do you put T regs relative to NK and alpha beta T cells and other things that people are trying to make out of hematopoietic lineage? Yeah, I would, unfortunately, they're on the hard end of the spectrum. Um, okay. It seems, you know, it seems to be that, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, if one looks at kind of the evolutionary origin of cells, the, the ones that are kind of early are easier to get to. And so it's very easy to make NK cells, for instance, right? And uh, then when you go to alpha beta T cells, it seems that it's, you know, much easier to make these kind of immature CD8 T cells. Um, CD4s are significantly harder. harder. Uh, you haven't seen that much uh, publications on them. And then, of course, Tregs are a subset of CD4s. So <laughs> it's, been, it's been quite a challenge. But um, I think I'm pretty excited about the, the progress that we're making. Oh, that sounds really great. And so let's, uh, so, so back to Andrew then you, so you, you've heard saying about they, they've got the, uh, they've got an outlaw approach with their collaborators, Kite, they've got a long-term play in IPSC. How, do, how does Intellia think about allogeneic medicines? Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, you know, it's very, it's very much on our minds for sure. <clears throat> and, you know, I think that we think about, you know, I, I think this, Cell therapy has become very much an engineering and optimization problem. And I think it's important to think about it that way. And I do think that there is a future where allogeneic cells will be every bit as good, if not better than autologous cells and that we have to be thinking about shooting towards that goal. Um, I would also say that uh, currently, you know, as we speak in 2020, I don't think that uh, the allogeneic nut has been cracked, so to speak, uh, certainly in terms of TFM. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, I think it's fairly common. Everybody understands that knocking out the endogenous TCR is important in uh, avoiding graft versus host. And, and the most typical approach towards avoiding host rejection has been knocking out class one uh, of, the, of those cells. But when you knock out class one and or class two, you know, you introduce another problem. And I find that there's not a lot of people out there talking about the fact that when you knock out class one, you get an NK response to these cells, and NK cells are really, really good at killing cells without self or missing self cells. Uh, and, and for some reason, I don't hear a lot of discussion about that. And so I, you know, from a personal standpoint, I'm very curious to see persistence data on all of these off the shelf. You know, there's quite a few folks that are, that are working on off the shelf would really love to see some of the persistence data because our, our personal belief is that you need these cells to persist, certainly in IO, for a considerable amount of time. And there are some good publications out there that, that correlate the persistence of, of T cells with, with outcomes. So, you know, from our perspective, knocking out, uh, you know, C2TA is, is, is maybe not the, the right, or beta-2M C2TA is maybe not the right approach, um, unless you do some other things, you know, and there's other things on the opposite side. You can compromise the patient's immune system uh, to get them to, you know, not react to this for a while. But... I, you know, the main point being, I think there's still room for a better allogeneic solution. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, I would say that we're very interested in, in, in helping to figure out how that happens, because I think that will be good for patients and good for everybody. Well, that sounds really interesting. Are you willing to tip any of your cards about what you're thinking about, or is it just too early? It's a little too early for that, but we'll let you know as soon as we have something uh, that, that, that I can share. Okay. Uh, Jason, do you, what, do, what do you feel about the whole NK problem in the, in the allogeneic? How, how, how's Sangamo thinking about that? It, yeah, it's, it's certainly something that's on our mind, right? I think um, in, in the context of oncology, there's at least the, the possibility that one could for some short time operate under the cover of, of lymphodepletion, right? Um, and so that will fill it facilitate some amount of durability, but eventually the cell, the immune, the patient's immune cells will come back, right, and have the potential uh, to mount a missing cell response against those cells if they lack class one. Um, 
um, in in the in the case of the diseases that we're interested in uh, with T regs, I don't think we're going to have that luxury. And so uh, it's it's an issue that we are kind of squarely uh, attacking because we know that if we want um, T reg cell therapy to be successful, we're going to have to achieve some significant uh, amount of durability. And so if we want to have an allogeneic program, we're going to have to solve that problem. And I think, you know, there are a variety of approaches to, to doing it. Uh, and we're exploring uh, different, different options. Fascinating. I look forward to hearing more about that at, uh, from both of you at some, at some, some future date. So you, you've got two different technologies to edit. They, they, they both can get the job done. You want to, can you kind of compare and contrast what, what are the advantages and, and challenges with CRISPR and likewise with the zinc fingers? And so I want to start, Jason, since I've had Andrew on the hot seat for the first time every, th every time. But zinc, zinc fingers are really the pioneers of, of gene editing, right? I mean, Sangamo very much uh, led the way in, in creating engineered uh, products. So how, how do you, you know, kind of what's the state of the platform and how do you guys think about it now? Yeah, um, yeah, I think sometimes, especially, you know, uh, with the kind of the, you know, the landmark discoveries that were made around CRISPR, right, it's, it sometimes kind of overshadows some of the, the kind of pioneering work that was done in the, in the zinc finger field, but it, it is an amazing platform, and we have a, uh, a great uh, technology team that's kind of continuously innovating around the platform. You know, I think the things when we talk about the platform and we talk about the things that we think are uh, exciting and uh, advantageous, um, you know, one is that the the proteins are uh, humanly derived, right? So we feel like that that has at least the you know the potential to kind of reduce the uh, the uh, immunogenicity. Uh, zinc finger proteins are kind of as a class are the most uh, the or the largest segment of expressed proteins in in the genome. Uh, so there are a lot of zinc finger proteins, and so we have taken kind of modules, uh, you know, nucleic acid binding modules from a lot of these proteins, and that's and we've created this huge archive so that for any kind of stretch of bases in in the genome, we can kind of put together many different modules that target that uh, that um, that sequence. And so that's one of the, you know, we feel like we can essentially target any, any base in the genome with, with, with the zinc fingers. Um, and we also have uh, the advantage that these are proteins that we can kind of tune, right? And so uh, the team published some really beautiful papers in the last couple of years showing that we can alter the, uh, the interactions with the phosphate backbone of the DNA and thus reduce the kind of non-specific binding of the, the zinc fingers to the DNA. And this was a way to kind of dramatically reduce off targets. And then the other thing that they did was, so with, with our ZFN nucleases, what we do is we create uh, two different proteins that have uh, each have one half of the nuclease. And when the two proteins land on the DNA, the nuclease reforms and cuts, right? And so it allows us to add in some extra specificity but one of the other things that they've done is started to kind of tune the catalytic rate of the nuclease in order to also reduce off targets. Turns out that if you kind of counterintuitively by lowering the catalytic rate, you have, you increase specificity because you require longer dwell times on the right site. And so kind of non-specific interactions don't have time to get cut, right? Um, and then I think the other really exciting thing about the zinc finger platform is that it isn't just nucleases, right? We can kind of attach whatever functional units we want to, uh, to those zinc fingers, right? And so we have the potential to do base editing. Um, we're exploring the use of recombinases. Um, so we can do targeted, you know, swapping of large genomic segments without, uh, without free double-stranded uh, breaks. Um, which we think is pretty exciting. And then, you know, we, we also, you know, one of the kind of, the, we did two big deals this year uh, in the CNS space, one with Novartis and one with Biogen. And both of those deals were around uh, using zinc finger transcription factors to, uh, so that's a platform we can use to either upregulate or downregulate 
any gene and we can do it in a way that's very kind of titratable. We can, we can create, you know, zinc finger transcription factors that can kind of reduce the expression of protein by half or completely shut it off. Um, so it's a pretty uh, modular, uh, you know, toolkit that we have. And I think that's one of the really exciting aspects of it. And it's fascinating how far the zinc fingers have come over the last 20 or so years. I don't know exactly what the number is, but it really is a platform really continues to evolve. And so, Andrew, you want to comment on CRISPR? Where are we these days with CRISPR? Are we done or is there still innovation there? Oh, no, sure. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very much a pragmatist. So my, my rule is whatever works, uh, works, you know, the right tool for the right job. So there's obviously some, some differences uh, amongst these things. Um, and a lot of people like to put them in two separate camps and like shoot arrows at each other. But, you know, certainly if I found that a zinc finger would be a better way of, of doing something that we're trying to do, I'd go give Jason a call and see what we could work out, right? Um, I, you know, we're all, we're all in this together. I think some of the things that are exciting about uh, CRISPR, first of all, it's not just Cas9 and it's not just double-stranded breaks. So I like to think of it more as, you know, RNA-guided uh, nucleases, right? And... Um, so far, in terms of uh, what Intelia has done and all the work that we've accomplished over the last six years, both in vivo and ex vivo, we found, you know, it's just a tremendously flexible and, and wonderful platform to work on. There's pretty much not a gene that I can think of, at least off the top of my head, that we're not able to efficiently, you know, cut if we want to. Um, naturally, CRISPR is... is uh, uh, limited to certain PAM sites and, you know, you need to have a PAM site that's going to work. And we're still working through a lot of that biology. Um, but, you know, it works really, really well. And everything that certainly that we have a notion of bringing to the clinic, uh, we do so with, you know, essentially uh, non-detectable off target. So, you know, we, we found that it's working really, really well. Um, I do think that there's some very exciting technology going on now in terms of base pair editing and deaminases, uh, transposase technology, which are all, I, I think, you know, kind of related to this whole family. And what we're going to see is, you know, two years, four years, six years down the road, we're going to look backwards and go, wow, you know, life was so primitive. Our toolkit was so primitive back then. Now we can do you know, lots of interesting things, uh, fit for purpose kinds of things. And the, the one final thing I'll mention that I really like about, uh, you know, being able and having the luxury of working with CRISPR is just the unbiased screening uh, that we can do. So if it's a matter of, you know, we want to do a whole genome screen and look for various knock-ins or knock-outs that are going to affect the behavior of a certain cell type, be it T effector cells or Tregs or NK, um, you know, that's, a, that's uh, the kind of thing that CRISPR makes it, I wouldn't say easy to do, our discovery scientists will kill me if I say that it's easy, but it's certainly a, a very doable thing and allows, and you know, you've seen in the literature just the, the, the beauty of some of these screens and some of the genes that we've been able to find uh, that were not, you know, intuitively top-down driven. Yeah, it's fascinating on CRISPR's side as well. So um, these cell-based medicines are really complicated and and we're all making strategic choices about how we actually manufacture them. <clears throat> so, so Jason, can you comment for a minute about how does Sangamo think about the manufacturing of its cell-based medicine? So, what do you what do you buy? What do you do yourself? I just how, how do you how do you do this so you can? Yeah. Um, so we definitely uh, feel that it's important to have as as much control as we can, right? Um, and um, I think everyone in, in the field knows, you know, you often hear this expression, you know, the process is the product, right? Um, because because it, it is such a, uh, a complex product that, that um, the manufacturing, uh, having control of it and understanding it in a very kind of nuanced way is critical, especially as you kind of go from, you know, kind of an early phase one study and that kind of scale, or even, you know, kind of a research scale to your phase one to ultimately, you know, some kind of scale that's necessary for a registrational study and a marketed drug, right? Being able to think through a process that you can scale in that manner and still retain the same product is, is critical. Um, so, you know, I think we're taking a kind of a tiered investment approach. Sangamo has, uh, is, is heavily invested in, in manufacturing sciences. Um, we have built a lot of capacity initially around our AAV platform. 
So we have a, a, a manufacturing, a GMP suite at our site in, uh, in San Francisco, in South San Francisco. Um, and we are similarly taking an approach where, you know, we're, in, we're uh, investing internally, but at the moment also doing some partnerships with CROs to manufacture our process, to our cells uh, for the TREG program. Um, I think long-term, uh, we would like to bring more and more of that manufacturing in-house, uh, again, just so we have the control and understanding. But at the moment, you know, we're, we're doing a combination. Right, and how, how's Intel you thinking about this, Andrew? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in a similar way, the first thing I would emphasize is these are complex products for sure. And, you know, if I think back to 25 years ago when I was uh, doing various things in pharma 25 years ago, you know, manufacturing was almost the last thing that we thought about. And it was always this sort of afterthought, oh, they'll, they'll figure out how to get it done, right? And you never introduced that into the timelines and the cost was, was minuscule. So this has really changed. This is definitely a new paradigm and you have to pay a lot of attention to the tech ops aspects. It's an incredibly important part of where we're going. Um, and, you know, Jason's point as well, you know, you're, you're winding up with multiple drug substances to go into one drug product now, and these are biologicals, they can be viruses, they can be, you know, combinations of things. At Intelio, we use lipid nanoparticles, which is a, is a big piece of our, uh, you know, in vivo business. So, um, yeah, it, it's an area of much greater, I think, focus and concern than it has been traditionally. Uh, we also are looking to try to be intelligent about how we do it. And, you know, as a, as a company that's getting off the ground and that's been around for a relatively short period of time, uh, we look at the kinds of interactions that we can have with CDMOs. Uh, certainly the CDMO space is evolving quite rapidly as well. You know, and we go through these cyclical uh, sort of supply kind of dynamics with AAV and, and, and other sorts of things. And the market's responding and different companies are responding. But what I think is interesting is we do some of it, uh, some of our GMP engineering we do completely in-house, some of it we do completely externalized, and some of it now there's, there's more and more of these hybrid models where you know, we're bringing the process development and people into clean rooms that may be you know, organized and run by, by other folks as well. And I know a lot of, uh, of our peer companies are doing that. So you know, again, the, the, the emphasis has to be really on at every step of the way, figuring out how to reduce complexity, figuring out how to make this more modular and, and you know, understanding how we can do the bulk of manufacturing before the patient's actually in the bed needing the product. So that, you know, um, and again, to me, this is, is more of an engineering problem. If you can do the, the bulk of that, and allogeneic uh, sources certainly represent one way, um, iPSC derivation uh, is another, um, and then do kind of the last mile manufacturing before the patient, I think it's gonna be better for everyone. Well, that's great. Well, I think that um, we're coming to the end of our time that I, I really wanna thank both you, Andrew, and you, Jason, for a, a great discussion. Um, and I hope everybody out there stays uh, healthy and safe during the, during the pandemic. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, thanks, Charlie, and thanks, Andrew. It's been a great conversation. Yep, thank you both.